Welcome to the Songwriter Connection Podcast, where we look at the craft of songwriting through the eyes of the songwriter. Each week, we make a connection with a music maker, listen to their songs, and hear their stories. From Nashville, Tennessee, here's your host, Dave Lenahan. Just looking over my list here. If you are uh, listening on the day that this is published, it's uh, February 21st, and welcome to the show. And I believe this is episode 143. If you can believe that, I can't. And we're now over 500,000 worldwide listeners. Thanks again from the bottom of my heart. Uh, if you're listening on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe because that helps us right there too. And also big thanks to Red Circle, uh, my host. Um, they do a tremendous job. And if you're thinking about doing a podcast, I highly recommend them. They are fantastic. Well, here we are in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and, you know, I, I love living here. And we we talk about so much about all the great talent that is in this town. And, and I am so thrilled to have our guest today. I was even more thrilled to play along stage, uh, on the same stage with him a couple of times now. He is in the Musicians Hall of Fame here in Nashville, which if you've never visited that, you should put that on your list. Uh, his name is David Anderson. Hi, David. Hi, Dave. How are you, man? <laughs> Great to be with you, Dave. <laughs> Let me tell folks a little bit about you, because you, you really are an amazing talent. Not just a multi-instrumentalist, but a fantastic guitar player, a singer, a songwriter. He's played for over 2 million people at the Country Music Hall of Fame. He plays at, uh, you know, prior to the uh, the Country Music Association Awards show out there at Bridgestone Arena, uh, the uh, Walk of Fame ceremonies, which you did back in the fall. Right? Yeah, that's right. We did Don McLean. Don McLean? In, yeah, yeah. On the Walk of Fame here on in the Nashville. Walk of Fame. And you played for him? Yeah, I played all his great songs. Isn't that something? And he was sitting right there and accepted <laughs> the award graciously. How, is, how intimidating is that to, to play in front of guys like that? It can that? be a little bit, but it's also inspiring. You know, it's equal yeah. parts intimidating and inspiring because you're <laughs> sitting right there and you can kind of be with them and they're sitting there listening to you play and they go in a river thinking of listening to their song. Yeah. You know? But you're an old pro. You've been doing this. You know, some things that folks need to know about you, they say that you were playing music before you could talk, That's which right. surprises me. You're also a visual artist, which I want to talk about, right. an amazing artist, visual artist, talent in so many different areas. And oh yeah, he's known as the ambassador of Music City. So I wanted to start there. David, the ambassador of Music City on the Songwriter Connection podcast. So tell us about that title and how that happened. Well, you know, I was playing at the... Uh in town a lot and uh, playing at the major clubs and stuff and all of a sudden the Country Music Hall of Fame opened their new facility downtown. Beautiful. And it's, a, yeah. it's all brand new and perfect and Chet Atkins who I knew had told me, gee David, they got a, a new museum down there. You might think of picking your guitar in there. You know? Oh, we're going to talk about Chet yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, he was so kind and so I went down there on, on opening day they had a big, Chet had a parade downtown. Wow. With all guitar players and they walked <laughs> down uh, Fifth <laughs> Avenue down to the where the museum is and wow. it was really cool. It was early in the morning. They yeah. weren't open yet. But that was there that day. And then uh, I went in there a few days in a row. And they had you know other events going on, big grand opening events. But finally, I think it was on the third or fourth day, uh, they had me pick some songs in their lobby. There. Yeah. It's a big 11,000 square foot room. Oh, it's gorgeous. And it sounded really nice with the <laughs> guitar. And so uh, I got on board there as their staff, or a house guitarist. Wow. That's what they called it. What and uh, over time, I was able to greet just so many people there every day, including people like Chet and stars like Jerry Reed or mm -hmm. J Jimmy Dean or who it was. Everybody would come in there, you know, because it was right. a big deal. Dolly, you know. Dolly. But uh, so they over time, I think it was after the first year or first second year, I had played. They figured, well, they'd had a, a million visitors. They said, David, you've played for a million people, and I played a thousand days in a row. That's what it was. A thousand days in a row. It was like three years in then, wow. and uh, so they put out a press release saying that uh, David Anderson is a, a great ambassador for our music, our museum, and our city. Ooh. And somehow the uh, the press picked up on this. It was a press release, mm -hmm. and they picked up on it. And they started writing about me as. The ambassador of Music City. That's which, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, cool. and they kind of—that's what they started promoting. That, and of course, you embraced that too. Well, I did because yeah. it was something special, you know. Not yeah, always, not every day you're going to get a title in a town like Nashville, where I was. Yeah, work, working so hard just to become known, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I'd had a bunch of press already as a as a solo artist, mm -hmm. but uh, so I started playing there daily, and that's how that happened. They gave me the wow. title. Wow, and I heard stories that you would greet people, give them one of your picks with your yes. name and everything, and yes. welcome them to Nashville. And, oh yeah, I did that every year I'd change the color of the pick so they would come back the following year 
Uh-huh. They get one of a different color. It was kind of a little comeback <laughs> That's kind of cool. riff. But, oh, yeah, definitely cool. That's and awesome. people would people would come back, and they'd, they'd see me, and they'd go, oh, there he is, there's Dave. And they'd pull out their wallet, and I'd go, wow. And they'd pull out this little guitar pick, and they'd show me that they wave it around, go, I, I got your guitar pick. We came from Tasmania, you know. Oh, wow, oh, Tasmania. Yeah. Oh, well, people, I had a big wonderful. fans down there. I had a big number one hit. In Tasmania. It's a great place. It's man. called Squirrel Train. Oh, that's <laughs> was, right. That's right. It yeah. was number five for the whole year of 2023. I can't believe that. Oh, man. So, yeah. I'm waiting for that check to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That'll go to Waffle House. That'll be big. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm buying. Coming, I'm coming along. I'm coming <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> and we always talk on this show about how, you know, there are so many great musicians, and, and people have this impression that you're from Nashville, so you must be a country musician. And I always talk about, yeah, you know, don't worry about genre. Be you. And you are one that has really spanned all the genres. I mean, really, if anything, you're, you're, you're jazz right. and, and country, and um, your style is, is absolutely incredible, but absolutely yours. Thank you. Uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I know you t- picked up the guitar at a very young age. Huh? Yeah, I was very young, and I grew up in Los Angeles, which was kind of a, another music city of a, yeah. of a sort. Oh, absolutely. But uh, and I, a lot of people that I grew up with, they uh, also were songwriters and guitar players and stuff. So you kind of tend to gravitate to other guitar players because yeah. as a young kid, you'd want to get learn how to play a chord or something. Yeah. I remember I wanted to get some jazz chords because my parents <laughs> both played, but they played the piano. Okay, and I played piano too. I, you came from a very artistic family, yeah, right? yeah, definitely. Other musicians and things, and they weren't professional musicians, but they were very skilled and read music, and they taught me to read music. Mm. And I remember going, "Well, there's chords though that I, that are that I hear these jazz guys playing, and I didn't know what they were." Mm. And I, I, a friend, child, a friend of mine was Jackson Brown, the songwriter. Jackson Brown and his dad, I love Jackson. his dad was also a, a jazzer and a pianist. Really, who in the after World War II had actually played with Django Reinhardt. Uh, no in, informally. Wow. But, uh, and Jackson was the first guy I knew saw play a ninth chord, you know. I love that chord. Well, that's how I learned the chord. But what is that chord? You can take it right like, up the neck. Yeah. <laughs> that's jazzy. But he taught me that chord. But wow. it's, those, those kind of things were, and your other kid friends, they were doing stuff and writing their own little songs, and we'd share them at the park and stuff. You know how you did yeah. it. I was a surfer, so you take your guitar to the beach. And oh, yeah. I'd come in from the water, and you'd pick on the beach around a little campfire. And <laughs> and I, it always helped me get a ride to the beach from the older kids who drove. I couldn't drive you. Mm-hmm. And they'd let you bring your guitar. You're going to bring your guitar because then the pretty girls in the bikinis oh. would come and want to hang out, you know. <laughs> no, you didn't like that at all. That was my ticket to, you know, getting the big... In the, in the car. That is awesome. So you grew up around that. Jackson Brown and all the... You played at the Troubadour and, and all oh, those yes, famous in, places that we read about. Oh, yeah. I played there when I was just a kid, really. Mm-hmm. It was it was a place where the, uh, you could feel... This is pre-internet, so there was no promotion of it, but you could feel that it was something magical about it. And there was another club called the Ash Grove down there in Hollywood on Melrose. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was where all these rootsy kind of artists would play, like, you know, Bill Monroe or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, other other roots artists. Roots, yeah. And, of course, there was still a big dovetail between folk music and what, what became songwriter, singer-songwriter stuff at the time. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Linda Ronstadt, who I met like in the 60s, when wow. she was just starting out. How about that? And she was so nice. And I, I'd go to her shows at the Troubadour, and you know, there'd be like 10 of us in the audience or something. Eagles guys there too, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, I knew them. Mm-hmm. And later on, when we got the old, little older, I was working with uh, opening shows at, at folk clubs. They mm-hmm. called them folk clubs. Did they, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't serve alcohol. It was like <laughs> coffee house kind of thing with the, yeah. the plaid and uh, tablecloths. And Jackson and I played a lot of them. Also, the guy Tom Waits, if you remember oh Tom Waits. Gosh, I love Tom Waits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was just a great guy. Yeah. But also such a character. And so we played these little clubs. You know, uh, I would often open the show for these guys, the Persuasions and different mm. different artists. Wow. But, uh, and then when he finally started playing at the Troubadour, I'm like, well, man, you got to check out this Troubadour place. This is very cool. Mm-hmm. A lot of cool people hang out there. Yeah. So we started, I started getting rides up to the to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. To play there, and it was a really cool thing because they had like what was a, a Monday night, I think it was, and it was like you know, opportunity night, whatever they call it. And uh, many, many people would play on this kind of like before the open mics, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't exactly open, you had yeah. no audition, but still, it was mm-hmm. a similar thing. And you'd have to be the Kingston Trio to be on the <laughs> show, but uh, it was really cool because the Troubadour that had this vibe to it that was just 
a magnet, you know. You could, just, you could just feel it. And all of Hollywood was like that. I was there in the 60s when, mm-hmm. you know, the whole hippie thing was happening and the early rock bands like uh, The Doors. Were, yeah, were I was going to ask about they that. They were playing yeah. locally. So it was like a vibe of music. Mm-hmm. And so you, it gave you a sense of aspiration that you, there's somewhere to, for me to build this too somehow. There's a, a, a bridge I could create that might take me somewhere. And uh, the, the Troubadour was definitely the portal to that. Well, you know, Dave, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I still think, and I maintain, to this day that I think we lived through the greatest era in music in music history we really did and if you think about those rock and roll eras through uh, the songwriter all of that that, that whole LA scene that you're talking about mm-hmm. um, and how much the music had changed just years prior right you know um, it opened up it opened up and, Buffalo and Springfield and Buffalo Spring- New Young yeah all those guys they were kind of LA guys they weren't uh-huh. necessarily from LA but right. uh, they played there and it was like a whole vibe. You Joni know. Mitchell. Joni, uh, all, who I knew. She was great. Yeah. And Graham Nash and all this. And you just think about it. You know, um, a while back, I'm listening to... Bonnie Raitt was another one that was there all the time. I was listening to a radio station that was playing popular music, uh, one of the AAA stations here in town, and they played a cut from David Bowie. Right. And I started thinking from an album in, in, in 1970. Three, I want to say. I'll mm-hmm. just say 73. Right. And it was 2003. So I started doing the math in my head. And I went, if you went back in the same amount of time from 1973 back, right. you know, 50 years, right. you were talking Charleston. Oh, yeah. And you were talking a totally different type of music. Yeah, Crone, yeah. Uh, the singers were crooners because that's right. the microphone technology. And, and just to think about how that music today is still so relevant. Right. You know. Uh, and you lived it, and you were there and experienced that. Oh, yeah. I you ever think of, about I that? I do. I, I was part of it, and it was really something because you could feel it just on the street. Now, nobody yeah. was promoting this. It wasn't on the news or something. They, they didn't right. talk about music then mm-hmm. on the news, but it didn't, hadn't become a story yet. Yeah. But you could really feel that this is a place and a time where magic is happening. Yeah, yeah you could tell. Oh, you could feel it, yeah. Yeah. And, of course, and then uh, Jackson moved up to L.A., after he got out of high school and he'd done some traveling mm-hmm. and he, he moved up to LA, up to Echo Park and uh, uh, Silver Lake area. Mm-hmm. And he, he, I went to his house and visited him. We would jam on Saturdays or something at his house. Wow. And he lived in this little duplex. And on the other half of the duplex lived uh, Don Henley and Glenn <laughs> Fry, who were, who were playing. They were, uh, Don, uh, Glenn had a group with J.D. Souther. They were the, called the Long Branch Penny Whistle. Really? Like a folk duo, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, Poso Seco Singers yeah, kind of a yeah, thing. Yeah. And uh, I opened for them a couple of times down in uh, Huntington Beach at the Golden Bear. Wow. But uh, they mm. were great. And anyway, they were living right there, and so you'd sing your songs or whatever. Yeah. And then they got the gig, those two guys got the gig uh, as Linda Ronstadt's backup band. That's right, right? Stone yeah. Ponies? Well, this was, was after before the Stone Ponies. That, that, she already had, Stone Ponies was at her early group, which mm-hmm. I knew those guys, Kenny and, and Bobby Kimmel, Kenny Edwards. Wow. They, they still play with her later, but uh, huh. yeah, she had this other, it was like more of a rock. And this is when she finally had her first uh, solo album. It was on Capitol. Hmm. I think 72 or 71, something like that, 70. And they were played the Troubadour. Oh, and, wow. uh I remember going and Jackson opened for them, and then wow. and then Glenn and Don were in the band. Also, Chris Etheridge and Bernie Leadon. Bernie Leadon, Kevin Eagle. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. one night they came backstage, and Don says that Jackson was sitting. He was drinking a. He didn't drink much, but he was drinking a brandy, which was you know <laughs> a little out of his league. But uh, and and Don goes, who was always Mister Idea Man, right, and kind of edgy a little bit. He goes, hey man, hey. Jackson, we got to quit this band and start our own band, and you could get your big time manager to get us a record deal. You know, and then we'll write a song. And <laughs> Just joking around. I remember looking at Chris Etheridge, and we looked at each other like, "Wow, is something happening here? We need to think about what is this." You know, <laughs> and of course, it became the Eagles, and wow. the song was "Take It Easy," which they wrote. Was it really? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was their first. Jackson wrote that. Yeah. Well, he yeah. co-wrote it with, co-wrote with them. Yeah. I remember reading, uh, you were talking about how they lived next door, and how um, Hanley would say he would hear Jackson just playing the same thing over and over again. Oh, yeah. All night long trying to get it right, right until he got it. Uh, just a perfectionist. He was, was a perfectionist. His mom was an English teacher. Oh. And kind of critical of <laughs> the language and the correct grammar and all of that. <laughs> And I, mean, I was, laugh because my wife's an English teacher, well, you know, and I still get that to It's a great benefit. Yeah, really. it is. But I remember in the early days, we would play these little shows, and he had written this, 
a song that he really liked. Uh-huh. Uh, we, I had one, uh, what was it called? Behind Your Eyes. It was like dreaming what is behind her eyes. You know, what uh-huh. she really thinking. Yeah. And he, he always liked the song. And then he came up with a song, uh, Doctor My Eyes. Oh, yeah. And he had the first verse, and he had the chorus pretty close, but he would just play it over and over again. And it took a long time before he was happy with the second verse. Mm. So he would sing the song, even at the key. And he, when it came to the second verse... He would just kind of explain to the audience what what it was going to be like, what it was. <laughs> so he didn't have it yet. Have it yet. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow! But That's um, of course, he did eventually. Yes. Yeah. You've got your Beatle Love guitar, so why don't you play a little bit for us so we can hear a little of the the David Anderson magic here on the dining room table. <laughs> Thank you for bringing the guitar. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome. It's mm-hmm. great to be with you, Dave. Mm-hmm. And of course, songwriter connection. This is uh, something special for all songwriters because it's really magical when we realize that we're a songwriter. It's like a magical thing inside. Yeah. I grew up with all these other artists, and I thought, eh, everybody writes songs. You know, it's not the no big deal. I'm oh, not but special. But the thing is, when you get on the real world, you realize, no, not everybody does this. Yeah. And uh, it's a special gift, and pay homage to that and respect that. And uh, I started writing some songs after the COVID broke, and mm-hmm. it was get- leaving, and everybody was getting back to normal. And I had a vision of the world starting over again. And being all happy and all. Yeah. And so out of my fields behind my house, I would walk around. All these songs came to me, and this is one of them. I was born in the summertime, always been a summertime kid, but it seems like every time summer comes around, it's like in my mind I'm back in California, and Mm -hmm. it's the summertime, and the waves are breaking and all that. Mm. So I wrote this song. It was once upon a time, somewhere in the summertime, It was once upon a lullaby Over and over and over again Under a summer sky It was in the month of May In the middle of the day And I couldn't see one reason why Over and over and over again Under a summer sky The little birds with wings don't need the words to sing. They just go ba 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 da, ba ba da, ba da da, ba ba da, ba 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 da, ba ba da, ba da da, ba ba da. Now maybe I could learn to sing, and I could give her my ring, and we could give that wedding thing a try. Over and over and over again. Under a summer sky The little children play Without a word to say They just go ba 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 da ba ba da ba da da ba ba da now it's just like a dream come true Walking down the avenue Underneath the full moon in July Over and over and over again Under a summer sky Under a summer sky David Anderson's our guest. It is the Songwriter Connection podcast. And uh, you can't see what he was doing, but he was all over that neck, <laughs> like a true <laughs> virtuoso can uh-huh. be. And the thing I love about watching great guitar players like you, David, is you make it look so darn easy. And I know it's not. <laughs> I know it's not, but you do. <laughs> well, I was lucky as a kid. I got to see some really great guitar. I saw Segovia, and I saw Joe Bass play. who was yeah. one of the great guitars of all time. Wow. But Who was your favorite? I think Joe was pretty amazing, but yeah, Segovia was also just yeah. what a tone. Yeah. But the thing I remember going to hear him and going, "Well, I'll learn something from watching him." But it was yeah. like what you said. Yeah. They worked all the kinks out of it, so it's just so He's effortless. A- you don't see him doing anything. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I saw Hendrix play. It was like you couldn't pick up anything because he was. It looked so easy. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's brilliant. Thank you. And you and, and the song from the songwriting standpoint, you were telling me 
uh, that the melody came to you first. And that happens a lot with you, huh? Yeah, I, I think it's kind of cool to write the melody first. I met uh, a bunch of great songwriters when I was a kid in Los Angeles. Uh, Bob Crew, mm-hmm. uh, Hal David, who wrote oh, lyrics wow. for Burt. Yeah. I met Burt once, but I didn't really get to talk to him much. But Hal, I, I had a, an audition with, and mm. he really helped me. And I asked him, how does he write the lyrics with Bert, did I think in the same room writing the song? You, know, you yeah. imagine him there with pencils and writing it up. Right, he right. said, No, Bert writes the melody himself. And he said, He always writes the melody with one finger on the piano. I mean, he's a good piano player, but he'll write it with one finger to make sure it's just really definite and specific. Wow. And he doesn't worry about the chords or any of that kind of stuff, or the rhythm or the timing of it. So if it's promises, promises, ba ba ba, or trains and boats and play, it might be a different thing all the time. Oh. And uh, what's it all about? Alfie. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the great lyrics of all time. But he said then he always would, then he would write the lyrics to the to Bert's melody, you know, which is I think if you're going to do that, that's the easier way to do it. A more difficult way would be the way that Elton John did it. I was just thinking he'd about get, that. He'd get the mm-hmm. lyrics and then write the music to it, which is amazing. Yeah, that he pretty tough and say, hey, here's his lyrics. But that he could come up with those great things. But yeah, so I was trained by them and, and helped, mentored by him. And Bob Crew, mm-hmm. I knew Jackson and Tim, Tim Buckley and Tom mm-hmm. Waits, a lot of great songwriters. Yeah. But this guy, Bob Crew, who's not as well known now, but he was a great producer in the 60s and he worked with... the. Uh, Frankie Val in the Four Seasons. Oh, huh. He wrote mm-hmm. Big Girls Don't Cry and no Sherry Baby and all this Sherry stuff. Baby. And he was a great songwriter and he was a pianist. He had a little house up in Be- uh, Beachwood Canyon. Mm-hmm. And a little great baby grand piano. And he had tape decks on the wall and big 15 inch reel to reels full of his hit, hit songs that he'd written, you know, back wow. to the 50s. Can you imagine? Palisades Park and this kind of stuff. Oh, but anyway, one day he called up my buddy, who was a good friend of mine, Tony. And he said, oh, you guys got to come over to the house. I got this. I wrote this song. And it's going to be the big one. It's going to be, it's going to be worldwide smash. Hmm. And Tony's going, well, we better get over there and hear what this is. And so he went over there and uh, he was just ecstatic, which was really cool. And uh, he uh, hits at the piano, he hits a diminished chord and goes, uh, my eyes adored you, oh. but I never laid a hand on you. My eyes adored you. Oh, yeah. Like a million miles away from me, you couldn't see how I adore you. It's that melody, of course. So close, so close, and yet so far. Well, it was just like such a beautiful thing, and he's going, but mm-hmm. this is going to be worldwide. He could knew. He'd banned enough yeah. hits. Yeah. And so it, it ended up being that. It was like a show sure around the world. Right. Herb Albert, was it? Did he sing? Was, it, was, Herb, was Herb the one that sang that originally? Or? He did it too. Yeah. But I think the big hit was Frankie Valley. Was it Frankie Valley's first? But uh, Bob was a great producer. He produced Patti LaBelle. Oh, if you wow. remember Creole Lady Marmalade. Oh, yeah. Bob produced that. Too. Absolutely. Bob great. was a genius. But just knowing cats like that gave you kind of. I'll bet. Yeah. And having even their modicum of approval, you it gave yeah. you permission to yeah. keep going, you know. Yeah. Who was the first that you uh, saw and met that, uh, that you really wanted to emulate that, that you feel brought you to the next level? Did you have a mentor like that? Uh, probably for me, just have I met him once, and he was a songwriter, singer. This would be in the early '60s now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hoyt Axton. Oh no, kidding! He was a great singer in Orange County. There, he played a lot of the beach clubs, and somehow he was a, a he's sensation. A he's from out here, but or Oklahoma. Yeah. But uh, I didn't know anything about his history or any of that stuff. And of course, this was before he. Yeah. Danny, but he had written a song called Greenback Dollar. Remember that? Which the Christie, uh, new Christie minstrels had recorded. And, right, and, and uh, the Kingston Trio. Kingston too. Trio, yeah, too, definitely. Yeah. And it became like a, a folk music standard. Yeah, it did, way. yeah. And his songs had this feeling like they were written 100 years ago. They could he was be so clever. clever. Yeah. And also a guy named Steve Gillette, who was a great <laughs> songwriter there, too, in, a, in that similar kind of a folk style, mm-hmm. who wrote songs to great songwriter and yeah he had a cut with Garth he had some different wow. cuts backing up to Hoyt Axton who's his mom wrote Heartbreak Hotel right yeah for Elvis May Bourne Axton May Bourne Axton she was right. when I first came to town here in the 90s she was a, a yeah. local fixture at writers nights yeah and she listened to your song and kind of give you a song doctor a little bit and stuff she was really oh, nice cool. just a great uh, mature lady you know just super person mm-hmm. and she was everybody's friend and stuff she was amazing amazing but mm-hmm. that was and I wasn't really I didn't realize that that was his mom and stuff then at the time but mm-hmm. then I put that together later that that was now you grew up in California right well by 1990 you're here in Nashville yes yeah, right I came out here on just on a whim and I happened to meet uh, Chad Atkins that's what I'm getting to me and my uh girlfriend we had driven a truck out here we mm-hmm. went to austin to in west virginia whatever we finally ended up back here in nashville 
and uh, Chet was given a, a lecture or something out at the airport at this Sheraton Inn out there. Mm. And so she says, well, we better go out there and just hear what, what he has to say. He's your, one of your favorite guitarists, you know. Yeah. And, of course, we went out there, and I got to meet him. You had to wait in line to meet him and all. And I'm kind of overwhelmed to meet Chet. It was a big deal, you know. And he was a king of the hill at the time. Oh, yeah. Major producer, you know. Sure. And uh, my girlfriend, though, who was not shy, she was a real pretty girl from the big city. She goes, well, you've got to hear David play, because he's really good, too. And I really love your music, but, you know, you got to hear him really good. God, very, her. very forward. Yeah, God, God love her. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it was really cute, because he goes, well, yeah, I'll have to remember that. And she gave him my card and stuff. And later I got a gig down on Music Row at the Slice of Light, which was a health food restaurant right there on Division Street and 18th. Okay. It was right around the corner from his office. And all those people that played in Nashville as studio stuff and publishers, they all would go in there for lunch all the time. Mm-hmm. And I played there just house musician playing standards and stuff on a Telecaster. Mm-hmm. And uh, he heard me playing. He really found favor. And it was kind of funny how it, the chords I was playing and stuff, he just really loved it. And he asked me to play a couple of songs, you know, All the Things You Are by Jerome Kern, which is a really beautiful but complicated song. Play, can you play a little bit? Of- uh, <laughs> this one here. Beautiful. But challenge you right on the spot, and boom, there it is. It did. <laughs> Beautiful. But he, I just went through it. I played. Yeah. I played it probably ten times through mm-hmm. the choruses mm-hmm. and I, different chords and stuff. And, and he just loved me. I remember he bounced up on a little stage that was in this little club or a restaurant, and he goes, "Kid, kid, kid, you must know a million chords." He said. <laughs> And that kind of stuff, other people heard him saying this, and, and of course it was, uh, he, I remember him asking me who who was my, like you did, he asked, mm-hmm. who, who were your heroes, how did you yeah. model this, where'd you get this style that, because yeah. you're playing the song, but you're not playing it like a piano yeah. book would, or the real book shows you, you got your own kind of voicings and stuff, and he was always, oh, always learning, he never stopped wanting to figure something out, I mean, he okay. was just a very inquisitive spirit, mm. and so he wanted to know, and I said, well, you know, I, I listened to, you know, George Van Epps, and Joe passed, and he's going, yeah, yeah. He said, but, you know, you don't sound exactly like them. He said, I know all their records, and you're not doing their version of that song, because I know those. And he said, there must have been somebody who really inspired you. And I said, well, you're right, Mr. Atkins. There was one guy, (laughs) and he's the reason I drove over two major mountain ranges and three major rivers to be here in Nashville. And I said, he's you, Mr. Atkins. Wow. And he was all... He kind of got real humble. I didn't realize how humble he was at the time. Mm. And he kind of, I remember he looked down at the ground, and he said, well, shoot, son, you, but you must have listened to a lot of Johnny Smith, too, he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was such a great guy. You developed quite a friendship, didn't you? Well, he was the kind of guy, he invited you in to do that. Mm-hmm. And if you just went to be with him anywhere, he'd have uh, breakfast over at the Cracker Barrel on Charlotte mm-hmm. Pike or different places, and you just sit down and shut up and listen to what would come up. <laughs> That's what I would have done. And he told me, one of my favorite stories of him is when he was had invited Lee Hazelwood, the great songwriter, Boots Are Made For Walking, great mm-hmm. record producer. Yeah. Had had a ton of hits out in California and all over. And he invited him out to join him in Nashville and just kind of visit. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, uh, so they spent the day together and Chet produced a record, some a record, and it all gone well. And they were having a little drink in the office after the... Uh, after the session. Mm-hmm. And, and Lee had had a grand time. I mean, he was just going, wow, the Nashville is just so amazing. Ch- Chet. But Chet was competitive, too. He was a big producer. Mm-hmm. And he goes, but very wry and sly. <laughs> and, and, and Lee's going, well, gee, I, I, you know, I just love Nashville. There's such a great vibe with all these musicians. And yeah. all, it's all right here. He said, how inspiring. He says, you know, you know Chet, this is funny, but I, I'm thinking I might want to move here. And Chet goes... Yeah. Yeah, but what would you do here? He said. <laughs> Zing. <laughs> what would you do here? <laughs> well, David Anderson, the ambassador of Music City, is with us. We're going to take a little break. We're going to come back and hear more of your music, okay? Stay yeah, with man. us. How'd I do? You're listening to the Songwriter Connection, connecting with music makers and hearing their songs and stories. Now back to the show with your host, Dave Linehan. David, David Anderson is our guest. He's got a new CD out called When Springtime Comes Again. That's right. I'm holding it in my hands right now. One thing I want to say about you, David, and, and you know what, as, as recently as 
uh, New Year's Eve. I was oh, on yeah. stage and you joined me. Oh, man. And I'm like, oh, man, just, you know, throwing the little leads in between stuff I'm doing. And it was just such a thrill. But the other thing about you, you dress to the nines, my friend. And I, I really admire that. You know, I was saying on a, a, a recent radio show or podcast how uh, we went to um, the Opry back in the fall. Mm. And I remember my first trip to the Grand Ole Opry was 1980. I mean, I'm really dating myself, right. but I was a young oh, country yeah. DJ at the time. Oh, yeah. And what always impressed me was how all of the stars, I mean, back then we're talking Porter Wagner and you're talking um, oh, Porter Ernie Ashworth and, uh, you know, and, you know, and they always came out dressed to the hilt. They had the nudie suits and the Manuels and the, you know, they, they look sharp and they'd come out and fresh so, haircuts, fresh uh, haircuts. I mean. I mean, right. You know, and so <laughs> this last trip, uh, I'm saying to my wife, Patty, I said, look at these. And this is a big star. He just looked like he just rolled out of bed. His <laughs> pants are all wrinkled and his hair is all messed up. I'm like, and he, I, I was just like shocked. Yeah. You know, this is the Grand Ole Opry. Yeah, yeah. You know, but you, when you come out to play a, a gig, you you dress the part. Well, I, I you know, that's what uh, Chet said. You got to dress the part. I agree. Uh, you know, uh, and he he always had a, his own style, although it wasn't super tuxedo look, but uh, he had his own style. He, he'd wear plaid pants and yeah. stuff. And you go, wow. <laughs> yeah. But he could pull it. And he, I remember when I knew him, he'd also had a tam, one of those hats with a little thing on top, palm on top. Yeah. And he'd wear those. And like, wow. I couldn't pull that off. <laughs> couldn't pull that off. <laughs> but yeah, I always felt like, you know, it, people listen. Uh, actually. Uh, they take you serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took it seriously. And, and uh, uh, he one time said, uh, you know, David, uh, people listen with their eyes. Wow. He said, if you look relaxed and happy and all, they're going to feel that way, you know. And, uh, yeah. of course, with style, of course, I come from Los Angeles, too. So when I grew up in the music business there, or in the world of music business, uh, people were trying to get into the music business. But mm-hmm. the real business you were trying to get into was the hot movies. <laughs> you know, you wanted to be yeah. in film. And I know right, so many right. players that were like good players, but they were really actors and they were tr- taking acting lessons and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I caught the bug too a little bit. I did take some acting and, uh, you know, went on some auditions and all, but I realized that wasn't really my thing, but, uh, it was one of those deals where, you know, you have to look the part, you know, definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I liked, I do believe in that. And, uh, if you want to look really sharp, of course, you know, I had a tip from who, I don't remember who it was, but, uh, if you want to, you're on a real pressure gig, you want to look great. Don't wear something you've worn before. <laughs> wear something brand new because it's going to look sharper than if it's been dry cleaned three times. You know, it's just going to look sharper. And Porter was a total clothes horse. Oh, he was. Yeah. yeah something else. Yeah. He was a great guy, too. But uh, mm-hmm. of course, uh, Dolly, I played on stage with her a couple of times. And she always dressed totally t- to be Dolly. You know, oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a character. Takes a lot of money to look that cheap. Right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, love yeah. Dolly to oh, this yeah. day. That's yeah. the way she is. When you talk to her, I've been in a couple of conversations with her, you know, short. But mm-hmm. I mean, about two, three minutes into the conversation, you realize you're talking with one of the brightest people you've ever met in your yeah. life. I mean, Amazing. and she'll be kind of self-deprecating, but so funny, and mm-hmm. but also insightful. And Amazing. I played on her Walk of Fame induction ceremony, and it was a huge crowd, probably a couple thousand people in the park, and mm-hmm. it was a big deal of... Charlie Daniels was also being inducted. Wow. And uh, so there was a lot of people there. And other stars. They always have another star introduce them and present them with it. And yeah. I play all the music for all of them as they hit the stage or playing a Reba song or whatever. Wow. And I, for Dolly, I had played for the intro stuff like Jolene and of course. I Will Always Love You and those uh, songs, you know. Yeah. But then for her induction, I played the song... Islands in the Stream, which okay. is what she did with Kenny. And it's sure. a beautiful song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful song. Uh-huh. And just the melody and the chords are just great. You don't need to sing it. Mm-hmm. And I'm playing the song for her, and she's up at the mic taking, accepting the award, and then she finally goes down to the walkway and gets her star, and I'm playing the whole time. And she came back onto the stage, and, and uh, she said, you know, David, I love the way you played my song. But it, her part, it, it was they modulated in the song, the arrangement was. Right. And it was the C sharp, which is not a great key for guitar, but I, I could do it. And she said, that was so neat because, and she hadn't seen me playing it, but she had heard it. She goes, oh, I love the way you were able to play it in C sharp. And you weren't using the capo, she said. <laughs> she said, that's really cool. That is cool. But the fact that she could 
hear that it was in the right key. She said to my key, I had done that because she, and she actually sang a little bit of it just for the crowd, just a little snippet of it. Pretty cool. And she knew, noticed it was in her key. So that was kind of a, mm-hmm. a touch, a window in her genius as a musician that mm-hmm. she would have noticed that, you know, wow. in the midst of her whole amazing presentation. Wow. What an amazing talent. Yeah. What an honor, huh? That was the uh, th- and you're doing those still. Too. Yeah, over the year, I started that in 2006 when we first started. In the very first ceremony, they had a little ceremony out in the street in front of the, uh, the park there. And there was no stars in the, in the walkway. It was just starting. They were just announcing it, and the press came out. And it was Steve Cropper and oh. Earl Scruggs and um, oh, Rick Nelson's twin sons and mm. Pam Tillis. It was a few stars there, you know, yeah. just announcing this. And they had us all sign the, the first star. Just mm-hmm. It was a mock-up. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember Brother Earl, who was just one of the most humble guys you ever could meet. Earl Scruggs? Yeah. I mean, just, just unbelievably humble. Would have, would have celebrated his 100th uh, birthday uh, back in January. Just in January, yeah. 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 January 8th, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, he uh, was a great guy. Yeah. I mean, just a great I played for him at the Hall of Fame a bunch of times. Did you really? And uh, he was just so sweet. And, of course, I remember one time I was playing for a big event. And everybody was there. They had a big table set for all the crowd. And it was Vince Gill and all these people. And they had the big tables, like 10 people at a table. Mm-hmm. And he was at the table with Vince Gill. And they were all kind of talking about how great it was to be there and everything. And uh, Vince told somebody, hey, I don't, uh, Steve Warner. And they're talking about my Steve plane. Warner. And they're talking about my plane. Now, these guys are super players. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, man, I, da, 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 da. And I was playing, but I was standing near their table, and I, he, they didn't know I could hear him talking, so I was kind of getting all this praise from these people, and I'm <laughs> within earshot. Yeah. And uh, so Earl says, uh, Earl says, asked him if they knew me, and I said, yeah, yeah. And so he called me over to his table, and he said, uh, he looked at me, and he was real quiet, for he didn't say anything. And I'm going, well, is he going to say something? What am I doing? <laughs> I just stood there, and he goes, I, I, I love your picking, son. <laughs> Beacon. <laughs> and they were all howling loud. Yeah, it's oh, okay. Yeah. And I go, well, well, thank you, Mr. Scruggs. And I started to say something. He says, yeah, yeah. He says, but you haven't played my song yet, he said. <laughs> he wanted me to play Foggy Mountain Breakdown, which I play, you know. And so it's so cool, the window into how humble these people are when, yeah. you, when you meet them. In that. Even in a major situation like that, it was, uh, it was wow. at one of the induction parties. I how suppose. about that? But, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's incredible, incredible story. That's, oh, I yeah. love stories like this. I well, love that. I, well, I've played it, I think it's for now, uh, Don McLean, Mark. We just did Don McLean uh, mm-hmm. just recently. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Miss American Pie. Yeah, Miss American Pie, and I, and I Love You So, and mm-hmm. uh, Vincent, which Chet loved oh, that yeah. song. I played Starry, it. Starry I, I played them for him as he was yeah. getting his award. Uh-huh. And uh, we were all done with the event, and we, they were having, we were having pictures taken, you know, after the event backstage. Yeah. And Don goes... Uh, I said, well, congratulations, Don, on your award, you know. And he was wearing shades, and he's kind of going, he was shy, you know, really, like a lot of the writers and artists are. Yeah, it, there, it is. Yeah. A lot of introverted and people. I, I'm, I'm really shy, too, but my mom, as my mom said, she said, David, you were born humble, because we come up the hard way, and she goes, you were born humble. Mm-hmm. You were born humble, but it didn't last, she said. <laughs> <laughs> she stole it from Mark Twain. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> over the years I've played for, I think it's 104 uh, artists in the Walk of Fame. And so wow. to play for them, and they're sitting right there. Incredible. And, whether it's Alan Jackson or Garth or somebody, mm-hmm. they're right there. Michael McDonald, I remember oh playing God. for him. Yeah. And what a Fool Believes on the mm-hmm. court. Yeah. Guitar. Wow. But Don was so kind, he goes, uh, we having the pictures made. And it was all over, every all pressure's off. Yeah. He goes, uh, I, I, he said, I, I thank you, David. Thank you for playing my song, American Pie, mm-hmm. for playing my song with such consummate tenderness, he said. Oh, <laughs> consummate tenderness. Well, a very college way to put it, but I thought that was a cool <laughs> quote. But yeah, he was very nice. You know. Can I ask you about your induction into the uh, Musicians Hall of Fame? This is the Nashville Musicians Hall of Fame, mm-hmm. not the Country Hall of Fame. It's a, the a, Nashville, an organization. They have one in Kentucky, too. Mm-hmm. But it was uh, an induction. They awarded me that last was it last fall or early in the winter? Mm-hmm. And uh, what an honor. they had done a, a speech. Somehow my guitar, the guitar I played at the Country Music Hall of Fame was this Epiphone arch top, and I played it there every day. It, 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 it played over 6,000 shows. On the cover of the new record. Well, actually, is, that's not the That's same. not it? No. Uh, I, oh. the, the thing was is that the museum wanted me to 
donate it to the museum because it had played their opening day and every oh. day since then and played to over, you know, they said over two and a half million people over the years. Wow. And they asked if I would donate it to their collection, for their permanent collection, no. Uh-huh. Uh, and I said, yes, yes, I would. I thought, that what a great thing. Wow. Great place for it to go home there. And wow. so it was the guitar, it, it, it was, uh, they had a little uh, event for me there. Mm. It wasn't public, but it was, you know, in the in the museum. And so they, uh, they I inducted the guitar and... Uh, also, a couple of the guest books and stuff, some promo with it. Yeah. And they were really thrilled to have it. I was really happy wow. about that. Wow. But then somehow the mu- the Musicians Hall of Fame heard about it. One of them was there at the event or something. Mm-hmm. It was just an informal event. But uh, Donnie Reed, who runs the, uh, the, the Musicians Hall of Fame, the ALM Musicians Hall of Fame, he... Uh, he decided that I should be a member, you know, and they had just inducted Jeannie Siegley, the great Opry star, and the, the rock band Exile, which is a great rock band, you know. Both so, of them have so been on this podcast, by the way. Just saying. Yeah. You, you can look at Marlon past Harder. episodes and yeah, listen yeah. to those. They're fantastic. Both of them are great, yeah. and uh, Jeannie is a great friend. Love her. As an artist, I did her portrait not too long back, and she has it hanging on her. Oh, that's so awesome. Room. But the beautiful thing was that uh, Donnie said, well, we want to bring you into the Hall of Fame. And I thought, wow. You know, it was kind of a overwhelming to think of it. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I realized at that moment how other artists that get inducted in the Country Hall of Fame or the Musicians Hall of Fame, how they'd be humble all of a sudden at that moment. You know, mm-hmm. they're a big deal, but they get real humble, you know, and when, yeah. at that moment. you know, yeah. I remember Chris Christopherson saying... And I played for his induction at the Walk of Fame. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think he'd been a, ma- a member of the Country Hall of Fame. He might have been. But he was so humble and such a nice guy. You know, Chris is just no- known for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, nice. And he's, I said, well, congratulations. When we were done, I said, well, congratulations on your star on the Walk of Fame. You're there with Dolly Parton and Garth Brooks and all. And he says, well, you know, that's re- it's really nice. He said, but I don't know why they would put me into it because I really only lived here for six years. He said... <laughs> <laughs> but they get real humble. And oh, Alan Jackson, when I played for Alan, you know, I played Chattahoochee and Remember When and his great songs. And he was just so genuine. Mm-hmm. I've met him before, his wife, or his first wife, but uh, Patty. But uh, he was so nice. And I said, well, con- congratulations. He had just got an award for 22, 25 number ones. Well, that's think about pretty, that. Yeah, yeah, 25 number one songs. So I congratulated him. I said, well, you know, Alan, congratulations on 25 number one songs. He said, well, shucks, David, you know, I... Shucks. Shucks, you know, I, I only wrote 22 of them. He said. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, man. Absolutely. Let's have another song from you. I could talk... These stories are so amazing, and I could talk to you forever about that. Oh, okay. And I know when we get together, I do. I always ask you questions so they listen. So. But I want to hear you play more, because you're amazing. I've met people at the Hall of Fame or through these things, I always... I'm kind of like you. You want to interview them a little bit, but not make a formal interview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I have a couple of questions I'll ask them, you know. And it's always like I asked Hal David about Burt Bacharach, how he wrote his songs. He's always yeah. starts with the melody. So yeah. that's always one of the things I love to do, too. So yeah. uh, I've been blessed to be a fly on the wall in quite a few wow. uh, conversations between two other major people. I'm not saying nothing, but the, it, it, you're hearing what they say. Yeah. Kind of fly on the wall. Kind of exactly. Thing. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. But. Uh, as songwriters, we write uh, we write love songs, and you know, every once in a while, you uh, have to write a breakup song. Have to, and I've written a few, you know, like everybody, but, and they're usually kind of sad and treacly, and you know, crying your beer a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I wrote this one, and it was kind of like a get up and go, I'll be fine kind of a song, mm-hmm. and it's called. Uh, I'm traveling at the speed of sound. Hmm. Life was sweet, summertime. We were laughing every day. I was yours And you were mine Up until you walked away Now you might think I'm wounded But baby, I refuse Just to sit here stranded 
Since you cut me loose, I'm traveling at the speed of sound. No, I can't hear your goodbye. Loneliness can't catch me now. From now on, I'm gonna fly, traveling at the speed of sound. Perfume filled the air when my angel spread her wings. But where to turn when your angel just moves on to other things? Every door you close, babe, I'll leave one open. My heart may be broken, but it keeps on hoping, traveling at the speed of sound. No, I can't hear your goodbye. Loneliness can't catch me now. From now on, I'm gonna fly, traveling at the speed of sound. Traveling at the speed of sound. Ooh, I like where that ends. What is that chord? It's a. You got more e chords mi- than e- we can name, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about it. It's an E minor nine. E minor nine. Uh, nine chords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. Kind of like unresolved, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I love that. I remember I when I was a happens. kid, I was. I wanted. I could. I learned my folk. Guitar chords, what Chet Atkins called the meat and potato chords, you know, C, F, yeah. and G. And C, F, and G. Yeah. He, but, uh, it's the color chords that really. Yeah, really yeah, had the one that Pat, they used to call them passing chords. Passing you know? chords, yeah. And uh, my friend Jackson Brown, he was a good guitar player. His dad was a, a jazz piano player and had played with Django Reinhardt. But he wasn't Crazy. a professional, but he, he was a yeah. scientist, really. He was like wow. my dad, he was a scientist, a wow. musician. But uh, Jackson had learned his chord and he played it. One day or one night somewhere, and he goes. I thought, wow, I, I, that, yeah, I'm going. That's not a meat potato chord. What is that? <laughs> I didn't call. Not it. the easiest to play. So yet. I asked him what it was. He showed me how to play the ninth chord. So that's when yeah. I first learned my first ninth yeah. chord was from Jackson Brown. Wow, I remember uh, reading an article about uh, Lennon and McCartney getting on a bus and, and driving across town because they heard somebody over there knew how to play a B seven and they wanted to learn how to play it. Exactly. <laughs> well, you would do that thing. You would, you were just hungry to yeah. fill in the missing colors. You know, yeah. that you didn't have covered. Right. And of course, growing up in Los Angeles, I could go hear a lot of great artists mm-hmm. like you know Joe Pass and yeah. all these great guys. Amazing. But it, and Andres Andres Segovia, I got to hear him. Jackson got me tickets to see him at the. Big concert hall, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Wow! And I thought, and we were up close in the center. You could really see him, but uh-huh. he was so good, and he was up in years. Then he had played a million. You know, you couldn't tell what he was doing. It looked yeah. like he wasn't doing anything at all. You know, and Joe yeah. Pass was similar. It was like he, it just looked so natural, and he'd be looking around, smiling while he's playing all this heavy stuff. And I realized then, you know, I, what it, what it takes is you just got to do it a lot. I mean, there's no substitute for that. There really is. There really is. And Chet was an inter- Chet Atkins was an inveterate practicer. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, in his house there'd be guitars everywhere. It's like your house. There'd be guitars everywhere. There was one in the bathroom. You know, <laughs> and, and his I'm not office, that far. In his, off- <laughs> in his office and stuff. And in fact, uh, I remember Boots Randolph. There's a great quote, quote from Boots, the great sax player, player played yeah. on all the yeah. A team stuff. He said, well, he felt that Chet practiced too much. He said, it kind of made him sound fussy or something. So you got you to let go every once in a while. And one of the great guitar players, uh, jazz players, I met Herb Ellis. I met him mm-hmm. one time. I asked him about something, little short questions. And he goes, well, you know you know how you know in the standards? I said, I've learned all the standards, and I know how to play the heads and the chords. Give me on that. Yeah. Well, what, what's that other stuff you're doing? And he says, well, one night you're playing them. And you get to the middle of uh, when sunny gets blue or something, and he says, uh, or here's that rainy day. He said, and you forget something in the middle. And he said, that's when the jazz comes out. He said, you start playing, just you, you come out. Yeah. And I realized later that that was true. So when I yeah. first came to town, I got a gig down on Music Row playing at the Slice of Life restaurant on mm-hmm. Division Street on Music Row. And I played there like six days a week. I think it was five days a week. Wow. And I would do the standards. 
because mm-hmm. we were in the country music time, you know. Yeah. But I didn't want to play country covers for all these people doing the sessions, so I would play standards, you know, like yeah. all the things you are. Or, Sharpen the chops, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just do them over and over again mm-hmm. and have a chance to just play, 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 play. There's no substitute, like you said, for that. There, there really, really isn't. isn't. Especially on something like guitar, which on, in the movie... No shortcuts, are there? Yeah, well, when... No, there aren't. <laughs> As the uh, Latins would say, there's no easy way to the stars. <laughs> But uh, uh, I realized that that was really the ticket to it. You had to just do it just do a it. lot. And now, did you have training? Did you have classical no, jazz never, training? I never took a lesson on the guitar. Are you kidding I, me? I took piano. You know, my mom had given me Get piano. Get out of here. No, I never took a lesson. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you know, it was one of those things I could have. At a certain point, I could have. That's just God-given talent. I well, it's somewhat, but also just dogged, you know. I mean, just, yeah. you just stay after it. And like you were talking about the, 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 on McCartney, you just you find out somebody knew something you didn't know, you'd want to go watch him do it, you know, and find oh, out yeah. what that was. Absolutely. And uh, luckily enough, I grew up in a little town called Fullerton, which was where Leo Fender had invented the uh, Fender guitars, you know, mm-hmm. the Stratocaster, Absolutely. Telecaster. Absolutely. And uh, he mm-hmm. wasn't really a guitar player. I knew him. He wasn't a guitar player. He wa- he loved the amps. He was a radio guy, so amplifiers uh, and speakers and all like that. He loved that. Wow. Okay. And so he realized that uh, he wanted to build these big amplifiers, and all these archtop guitar players would try to play in them, and they would feed back all the time. I'm going to go off on a tangent real quick because <laughs> before we went on, you were telling me a story about how they used to bring Dick Dale in to test out the amps, <laughs> see so if he true. could blow them up. <laughs> he would come in because he he was right there in Orange County, and he would come in and play, and they'd have him play through a big old bandmaster, a twin, early, mo- and he would just play it so loud, yeah, you could hear him like blocks away, you know. And so we'd ride our skateboards up there and see this guy playing the guitar, and Dick Dale. it was amazing. Legend. It was amazing, yeah. you know. Absolutely. And they'd have guys do that like about Saturday mornings or something. They'd have guys come out and try it. And, you know, t- try out the amps. Uh-huh. So finally, when when he started getting the uh, Leo got people playing his amplifiers and clubs and stuff. Yeah, and then eventually people like Carol Kay, the great studio bass player from, mm. with, the, with the the Wrecking Crew in Hollywood. Oh yeah, she started playing a Fender bass, bass, yeah, which was not the stand up kind of bass, you know. Yeah, and uh, she's amazing. She, yeah, yeah, and she played on a zillion records yeah, zillion yeah 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 but uh so he finally started having that breakthrough there wow that's amazing a couple of things i wanted to talk about is you're a great visual artist too and you talked about painting uh Jeannie seeley's portrait right, but i've right. seen some of your art out there and folks can find you online right oh yes yeah, yeah. david anderson music mm-hmm. but there's there's a little bit about your art art on there too oh yeah they have a bunch of my pieces up there i actually trained as an artist no i did take a lot of training in that i always was gifted with the ability to draw faces and stuff as a little kid i've and seen I had, a little bit of your stuff it's amazing and I, I got notice in schools and stuff oh this mm-hmm. guy really can draw the mm-hmm. book and I thought, well, that, to me, it was just kind of natural. I drew all the time. I still do. Still sketch, do. Sketch yeah. all the time. Yeah. yeah. It's just something, it's all kind of automatic. And I find it stimulating and relaxing. But sculpture, too. Oh, yeah. I, I, so I trained in college as, as an artist and took, you know, two, three years of life drawing where you draw uh, nude models mm. and draw their feet and their ears and their hands, you know, wow. over and over again. Man. And fill up big books full of this stuff. Wow. And so it really put me, gave me a foundation. And out there, I had a lot of great teachers who were great artists kind of pop artists uh, pop art artists mm-hmm. yeah and studied the work of warhol and oh, no uh, kidding. Wow. Uh, roy lichtenstein you know oh. the guy who did the stuff from the comic books he would do those oh, big yeah, blows. Yeah, yeah. but I, st- I did copies of all that stuff and Cezanne and the, and the and the renaissance or the renaissance artists but also the impressionists you know yeah. everybody loves the impressionists you know i even said one of your uh, mona lisa's uh, yeah 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 i did a copy well i've done uh, just as a, a way of uh, I studied sculpture, too, and I love sculpture, but sculpture is really demanding and takes a lot of space yeah. and it takes a lot of time. I'll bet. But I kind of combined the two uh, disciplines, the painting and the sculpture, by uh, developing a way of cut. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you about next, because I saw a video of you doing that. Tell us about this process. It's just like a... You take layers of colored cardstock, you know, stiff cardstock, uh-huh. and you can get a zillion different colors and Uh it's all dyed all the way through so it's all the color all the way through Mm -hmm. and I would put one on top of another say a blue one on top of a yellow one Uh and you cut out a little moon shape and all of a sudden you got a moon in the sky. It's a different color. On the, in the blue sky and the, yeah. the, and the yellow moon. Yeah. And I realized, well, there's a whole thing I could do here with the sculpture. And I started layering them over and over again. I could recreate, you know, classic paintings by Renoir or Cezanne or Vincent van Gogh. That's when I kind of became famous, a copy of one of his self-portraits. But I would take all the brush strokes and redo it with a razor blade on 
colored it's, paper and la- overlay them. You know, it's 10, amazing. 10, 15 layers. Amazing. So it's like a 2D it. sculpture. Yeah, it is. A, it's a 2D sculpture. Yeah. That's what they would call it. Yeah. And and on your website, you have some, yeah, some video. Oh, yeah, I have some examples. You're putting it together. Yeah, there's a video of it. But blows me away. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And it's kind of, and I do black and white ones too. They're oh, just a few layers, mm-hmm. which I did of Jeannie and, oh, Gary Morris and mm. you know, Pat wow. Alcher, different artists and writers, Bobby Braddock. I did. Bobby. Uh, I love Bobby Braddock. Oh, yeah. I'd love to Great have him guy, on the show yeah. someday. Oh, man. I read his book, uh, uh, Life on the Row, and uh, just ate it up. Just mm-hmm. uh, amazing. Yeah. Amazing guy. Yes. Met him a couple times when I worked at Lexus in Nashville. He drives a Lexus. So, one of these days, you never know. <laughs> the king Maybe you'll run into him, literally. <laughs> Yeah, Bobby had a great story for me. I remember I, I uh-huh. played for him a bunch of times at the Hall of Fame, and of course, yeah. and also at the at Slice of Life. He used to come in there with the great country singer Deborah Allen. Oh, I love Deborah right. Allen. And they would come in and listen to me. He, play. he was really playing. good friends with Deborah and, and Rafe. Van oh yeah, Boy. they yeah, were Rafe. married. And, great guy. Yeah, yeah they yeah. were married. But uh, but uh, they, I would play their songs, you know, mm-hmm. and I play Baby I Baby I Love, yeah, and I play uh, you know He stopped Love on Her Today, but I play yeah. it chord melody style. And they were always so kind, and I was in the starvation days, so they would tip you big, give me a twenty dollar oh, bill or something yeah. like that. And he was so cool. And I remember t- interviewing him a little bit, Bobby, uh-huh. and uh, he had already gone through tough times of his own, mm-hmm. and had uh, come on uh, financially that he had to sell his publishing for his early stuff, you know, D I V O R C E, and you know, all those yeah. great songs he wrote, big hits, you know. And he had had to sell the publishing. And I said, well, man, that's, that's really, really sad. I, I'm sorry that that happened. He says, I says, when actually, David, it was actually a blessing because it made me start writing again. Again. And he started, and he had more hits afterwards, he sure did. you know. Yeah. So he said, it was really kind of a blessing that Buddy Killen sold all my publishing. <laughs> <laughs> Darn him. We can blame Buddy Killen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buddy also played for it. I played for his Walk of Fame. And did you? I did his portrait, actually, and it's at their family home. Wow. But uh, he was Incredible. a, a larger than life character. All that. A yeah. lot of those guys from those days were, you know, larger than life. Merle yeah. Kilgore, yeah, you know Merle. I met Merle a bunch of times, and he told a songwriter story, which I think was a great songwriter story in the '60s, early '60s. And in those days, a lot of the songwriters and the singers lived in Madison, yeah, somehow near the Opry, but you know, or not where the Opry is now, but. Uh, they lived out in that neighborhood. Yeah, Madison was a really big area for them. And, uh, Kitty Wells and all them lived out there. Mother Maybell Carter had a house out there in the, the you know, June and all, the Carter family. And uh, they would get together on Saturday nights or something like that and play songs and, you know, just goof around. Mm. And uh, and one night, Merle told the story, he said, well, they would maybe write something, you know. Well, he got the feeling... All of a sudden, he got this feeling that something was happening up in Mother Maples. He just got the vibe, he said. He just caught it at the back of his neck. Mm-hmm. And so he, uh, he called over and they said, No, 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 you got to hear this, man. June's writing this song. I you know what this really is going to be. Amazing song. This, this is awesome. Story. This was in 61 or something. Like yeah. That. And uh, so he gets in the car, races over there, man, to the house. Yeah. And he jumps into the middle of the songwriting session and helps her finish the song. And uh, it was called Ring of Fire. Ring of Fire. Yep, <laughs> indeed. So Merle got his way in on that. And of course, later, Johnny Cash recorded the song, but it was actually quite yeah. a bit later. She didn't actually know Johnny. Then. Yeah. But uh, the famous story with Ring of Fire was that uh, they were, Johnny was recording it at the uh, studio, and uh, they're doing the session, and Johnny was kind of in an angry mood. And whatever. whenever I met him, he was always in a great mood, but... He was kind of angry mood and maybe a couple of chemically induced things. <laughs> <laughs> and he was getting frustrated about this song. They were having trouble finishing the cut, the recording. Uh-huh. And he goes, uh, so, well, what do you want us to do? Try now, Johnny. We've tried everything. We tried this and that. He says, uh, I, want, I want some mariachi horns, he said. <laughs> I said, mariachi horns? He yeah. Said, yeah, yeah. How crazy is that? I said, well, well, yeah. well Johnny, what... <laughs> Well, get him in here, and they call up a couple of guys and got him in. I said, but what do you want him to play? I, said, I don't know what you want him to play. This called Cowboy Jack Clement. He'll know. Get him over here. <laughs> this is in the morning hours, you know. And so Cowboy comes over, and he woke out of bed to come over to the session, and because him and Johnny were really tight, so he went over and, and uh, he said, well, what do you what do you think they should play? And Cowboy goes, 
da 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 and he left. He just left the building. He just said something like that, and that's it. And without that, it probably wouldn't have been the hit it was. That's right, but it was out of genre for country music. Exactly. You know, and un- unusual. Well, there's a songwriter lesson for you right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Think Cowboy, outside the box. Cowboy's great. I got to record with him a couple of Did times you? at his studio. Yeah. And we cut half an album. We never finished it. But wow. uh, he was so great. And he had a zillion stories and uh, about songwriting. And, of course, he had been also a song doctor for other people. Yeah. He stopped loving her today and oh, different yeah. things like that. He was such a great character. I, Absolutely. I loved him, as everyone did. He was just a great guy. Last thing I wanted to touch uh, upon, you, I know you growing up in California, but you also spent some time in the Dakotas? Yes. Uh, my family's uh, all from Family there. farm? Yeah, the family farm's up there. And we would summer... I'm here in the big city, you know. So it was great refreshment to go out I'll to bet. the small towns in, in Dakota. And, so you and, had the best of both worlds. It was just fantastic. Yeah. And you'd run the tractor and do the hay baling and milk the cows and stuff. And, of course, it was refreshing to me. I didn't have to do it all the time, so it was, like, really, really cool. Mm-hmm. But it was so neat to go. And then they go into town on, on Friday night and go into town and get kind of dressed up and roll up their pant legs a little bit and just get a little spruced up and put a little butch wax in their hair. And see if the girls were out, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. You walk around, and wow. but it was so fascinating to be in a town where there's only 600 people. Wow. And as my cousin said, no, uh, uh, you know, everybody knows your name. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows who you're in love with. Everybody knows when your dad's getting out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> they, they know everything about you. And he confessed to me that he, by the time he was a senior in high school, that he had fallen in love with every girl in high school. Because oh. there was only 10 of them. But uh, <laughs> Oh, every girl. And that would have been me. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could really relate to that. Oh, me too. I, I Absolutely. Wrote a, I even wrote a song about that. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Can we hear it? Yeah, sure. Maybe take us out with that one. <laughs> Oh, Becky was the girl I chased through town with a ribbon in her hair. And Bonnie was the girl I gave my heart in our junior year. Jeannie was fine, she was all mine up till graduation day Back when I was a good old boy in the good old days Now me and Billy Joe would run the back road and not a care in this world we go racing through town with the windows rolled down Trying to catch the girls But the closest I came to lighting that flame Was in the back of his Chevrolet Back when I was a good old boy in the good old days Yeah, back in the good old days Couldn't get no better We had time to spend Money to lend and love could last forever Back in the good old days Oh, I still remember Back when I was a good old boy In the good old days Now me and Billy Now the sun's going down On this little town And I feel like singing the blues About all the girls I knew in this world Each one I hated to lose But I wouldn't be crying If I had a dime for every girl I chased Back when I was a good old boy In the good old days Yeah, back in the good old days couldn't get no better We had time to spend Money to lend and love Could last forever Back in the good old days Oh, I still remember Back when I was a good old boy In the good old days Yeah, back when I was a good old boy In the good old days David Anderson, our guest on the Songwriter Connection podcast. David, I can't tell you what a pleasure it was to talk to you, hear these stories. I love it. We could probably do four more hours of this, I'm sure. I could be four more hours <laughs> with you, too. We'll probably do it tonight. <laughs> Why not? Over a beer or two. Listen, you have to come back. I will do that. And thank Honestly. you so much for the opportunity. Thanks to, oh. to Songwriter Connection. Oh. Everybody out there listening. Got to tune in, Dave, every week. You never know who's going to be on here. Every Thanks Wednesday so much, morning, yeah. Thanks, David. David thank Anderson, you. our guest. Thank you for listening to the Songwriter Connection podcast. Find us on social media at Songwriter Connection. Also listen to Dave Lanahan's Nashville Connections radio show. It streams live every Friday morning on WOBL and WNOI. Look for us on Facebook and YouTube. See you next time on Songwriter Connection.